You're listening to Morning Short, the podcast that brings you one great short story every morning. Available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and any podcast app you like. Today's story is Curing a Cold by Mark Twain. Before we begin the story, I'd like to remind you to visit share.morningshort.com and invite a few friends to Morning Short. If 10 friends sign up using your personal invitation link, we'll send you a free Morning Short t-shirt. So start your sharing at share.morningshort.com. And now to the story. It is a good thing, perhaps, to write for the amusement of the public, but it is a far higher and nobler thing to write for their instruction, their profit, their actual and tangible benefit. The latter is the sole object of this article. If it prove the means of restoring to health one solitary sufferer among my race, of lighting up once more the fire of hope and joy in his faded eyes, or bringing back to his dead heart again the quick, generous impulses of other days, I shall be amply rewarded for my labor. My soul will be permeated with the sacred delight a Christian feels when he has done a good, unselfish deed. Having led a pure and blameless life, I am justified in believing that no man who knows me will reject the suggestions I am about to make, out of fear that I am trying to deceive him. Let the public do itself the honor to read my experience in doctoring a cold as herein set forth, and then follow in my footsteps. When the White House was burned in Virginia City, I lost my home, my happiness, my constitution, and my trunk. The loss of the first two named articles was a matter of no great consequence, since a home without a mother or a sister or a distant young female relative in it to remind you, by putting your soiled linen out of sight and taking your boots down off the mantelpiece, that there are those who think about you and care for you is easily obtained. And I cared nothing for the loss of my happiness, because, not being a poet, It could not be possible that melancholy would abide with me long. But to lose a good constitution and a better trunk were serious misfortunes. On the day of the fire, my constitution succumbed to a severe cold caused by undue exertion in getting ready to do something. I suffered to no purpose, too, because the plan I was figuring at for the extinguishing of the fire was so elaborate that I never got it completed until the middle of the following week. The first time I began to sneeze, a friend told me to go and bathe my feet in hot water and to go to bed. I did so. Shortly afterward, another friend advised me to get up and take a cold shower bath. I did that also. Within the hour, another friend assured me that it was policy to feed a cold and starve a fever. I had both, so I thought it best to fill myself up for the cold and then keep dark and let the fever starve a while. In a case of this kind, I seldom do things by halves. I ate pretty heartily. I conferred my custom upon a stranger who had just opened his restaurant that morning He waited near me in respectful silence until I had finished feeding my cold. When he inquired if the people about Virginia City were much afflicted with colds, I told him I thought they were. He then went out and took in his sign. I started down toward the office, and on the way encountered another bosom friend who told me that a quart of salt water taken warm would come as near curing a cold as anything in the world. I hardly thought I had room for it, but I tried it anyhow. The result was surprising. I believed I had thrown up my immortal soul. Now, as I am giving my experience only for the benefit of those who are troubled with the distemper I am writing about, I feel that they will see the propriety of my cautioning them against following such portions of it as proved inefficient with me, and acting upon this conviction, I warn them against warm salt water. It may be a good enough remedy, but I think it is too severe. If I had another cold in the head, and there were no course left me but to take either an earthquake or a quart of warm salt water, I would take my chances on the earthquake. After the storm which had been raging in my stomach had subsided, 
and no more good Samaritans happening along, I went on borrowing handkerchiefs again and blowing them to atoms, as had been my custom in the early stages of my cold, until I came across a lady who had just arrived from over the plains and who said she had lived in a part of the country where doctors were scarce and had from necessity acquired considerable skill in the treatment of simple family complaints. I knew she must have had much experience, for she appeared to be a hundred and fifty years old. She mixed a decoction composed of molasses, aquafortis, turpentine, and various other drugs, and instructed me to take a wine glass full of it every fifteen minutes. I never took but one dose. That was enough. It robbed me of all moral principle, and awoke every unworthy impulse of my nature. Under its malign influence, my brain conceived miracles of meanness, but my hands were too feeble to execute them. At the time, had it not been that my strength had surrendered to a succession of assaults from infallible remedies for my cold, I am satisfied that I would have tried to rob the graveyard. Like most people, I often feel mean and act accordingly, but until I took that medicine I had never reveled in such supernatural depravity and felt proud of it. At the end of two days I was ready to go to doctoring again. I took a few more unfailing remedies and finally drove my cold from my head to my lungs. I got to coughing incessantly and my voice fell below zero. I conversed in a thundering bass two octaves below my natural tone. I could only compass my regular nightly repose by coughing myself down to a state of utter exhaustion. And then, the moment I began to talk in my sleep, my discordant voice woke me up again. My case grew more and more serious every day. A plain gin was recommended. I took it. Then gin and molasses. I took that also. Then gin and onions. I added the onions and took all three. I detected no particular result, however, except that I had acquired a breath like a buzzard's. I found I had to travel for my health. I went to Lake Bigler with my reportorial comrade Wilson. It is gratifying to me to reflect that we traveled in considerable style. We went in the Pioneer coach, and my friend took all his baggage with him, consisting of two excellent silk handkerchiefs and a derogotype of his grandmother. We sailed and hunted and fished and danced all day, and I doctored my cough all night. By managing in this way, I made out to improve every hour in the twenty-four, but my disease continued to grow worse. A sheet bath was recommended. I had never refused a remedy yet, and it seemed poor policy to commence then. Therefore, I determined to take a sheet bath. Notwithstanding, I had no idea what sort of arrangement it was. It was administered at midnight, and the weather was very frosty. My breath and back were bared, and a sheet, there appeared to be a thousand yards of it, soaked in ice water, was wound around me until I resembled a swab for a Columbiad. It is a cruel expedient. When the chilly rag touches one's warm flesh, it makes him start with sudden violence and gasp for breath, just as men do in the death agony. It froze the marrow in my bones and stopped the beating of my heart. I thought my time had come. Young Wilson said the circumstance reminded him of an anecdote about a negro who was being baptized and who slipped from the parson's grasp and came near being drowned. He floundered around, though, and finally rose up out of the water, considerably strangled and furiously angry, and started ashore at once, spouting water like a whale, and remarking, with great asperity, that one of these days some gentleman's nigger going to get killed with just some damn foolishness as this. Never take a sheet bath, never. Next to meeting a lady acquaintance who, for reasons best known to herself, don't see you when she looks at you and don't know you when she does see you, it is the most uncomfortable thing in the world. But as I was saying, when the sheet bath failed to cure my cough, a lady friend recommended the application of a mustard plaster to my breast. I believe that would have cured me effectually, 
if it had not been for young Wilson. When I went to bed, I put my mustard plaster, which was a very gorgeous one, 18 inches square, where I could reach it when I was ready for it. But young Wilson got hungry in the night, and here is food for the imagination. After sojourning a week at Lake Bigler, I went to Steamboat Springs, and besides the steam baths, I took a lot of the vilest medicines that were ever concocted. They would have cured me, but I had to go back to Virginia City, where, notwithstanding the variety of new remedies I absorbed every day, I managed to aggravate my disease by carelessness and undue exposure. I finally concluded to visit San Francisco, and the first day I got there, a lady at the hotel told me to drink a quart of whiskey every 24 hours, and a friend uptown recommended precisely the same course. Each advised me to take a quart. That made half a gallon. I did it, and still live. Now, with the kindest motives in the world, I offer for the consideration of consumptive patients the variegated course of treatment I have lately gone through. Let them try it. If it don't cure, it can't more than kill them. Thanks for listening to the Morning Short Podcast. I'd like to remind you to rate this episode five stars on iTunes, and to visit share.morningshort.com to invite your family and friends to listen to stories from Morning Short. Learn more about the Morning Short Project and sign up for our daily emails at morningshort.com.